Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Sales Leaders as Talent Developers, Strategies for Success. My name is Alexa Rose. I'm the Events and Webinar Coordinator here at Brandon Hall Group, and I will be kicking things off for us today. Let's start with some introductions. Our presenters today are Claude Werder, Senior Vice President and Principal Analyst here at Brandon Hall Group, David Ash, Director of Sales Development at Alego. David is an innovative and proven leader who de delivers rapid growth with exceptional result results with over nine years of experience as a sales development professional. In this role, he uh, oversees a sales team responsible for growing the company's customer base, revenue, and profitability within the United States. Prior to Alego, David was a sales development senior manager at Dell Tech, responsible for the strategy and management of sales operations, including the business development teams. I would like to extend a thank you to Alego for sponsoring, today, sponsoring today's webinar. Alego develop, delivers a complete sales enable, enablement platform with patent, patented te technology to help sellers within buyers. Their sales enablement, leading, learning, content management, and conversation intelligence products accelerate performance for sales and other teams. Alego is a marketing a market leader approaching 1 million users across deployments in one quarter of the Jones Industrial Average Companies, five of the 10 largest U.S. banks, three of the five largest insurance companies, four of the five largest medical device companies, six of the 10 largest U.S. wealth management companies, 14 of the 20 largest U.S. asset management companies, and many other global enterprises. For those of you that aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, Brandon Hall Group is a research and analyst firm that empowers excellence in organizations across the world through our research and tools. A quick mention that we currently have several certification programs open for enrollment, including our Certified Learning Strategist Program. Visit certifications.brandonhall.com to learn more about how to learn that designation. Your participation in our surveys is one of the most crucial components for our research. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics that you can take a survey for, it's greatly appreciated. Links will be available in our handout or you can always visit brandonhall.com. All participants receive a piece of complimentary research once the results are analyzed. And finally, a few logistics. To ask questions, we ask that you please use the questions panel on your control above, control bar above. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will share a link to the recording and a PDF of the presentation via email in roughly 24 hours. If you would like to download a copy of today's presentation instantly, the link to do so will be available in the chat momentarily. The chat is also open for today, so we will invite you to join in on today's discussion and share your thoughts as we go through, or simply just pop in, say hello, and let us know where you're joining from today. And without further delay, I'll pass things over to Claude so we can dive right in. Well, great. Thank you, Alexa. Welcome, David. Thank you to uh, Alego for sponsoring today. We're excited for this discussion and uh, David's a great person to, to have to uh, to talk about this topic. He, he, he's great with this. Uh, we're going to go off camera uh, to try to uh, make sure we have enough bandwidth and that everything goes smoothly. Uh, but we will be right here with, with you. And uh, we want to make this, as, as Alexa said, very interactive. So feel free to put any comments in the chat. We'll be monitoring it and uh, handling any questions. And we'll leave some time for questions at the end as well. Yeah. Excited to be here. Very excited to talk about some coaching today. Yeah, it's gonna be a great conversation. Uh, Lex, if you can uh, take us to the purpose of the webinar slide. So really what we wanna to do today is provide sales leaders with strategies and best practices for developing talent within their teams. And we're gonna discuss the importance of talent development, including coaching and uh, high potential development and, and many other things. Yeah, we also want to make sure we're we're hitting on coaching talent, peer-to-peer uh, -peer coaching, but more importantly, how are we coaching our coaches to be the best coaches they can be? Great. So let's get started, first of all, with a, a quick poll question. We just want to get a sense of who's, who our audience is today. So what best describes your job function? We have a few choices for you. A uh, sales leader a sales individual contributor, sales trainer, sales enablement professional, a learning leader, maybe not uh, specifically focused on sales, but uh, involved in some sales uh, learning, instructional designer, 
or other. Uh, feel free to add your, your title or your role in the chat. We'll give you a few seconds to answer, then we'll be ready to roll. And let's see. So um, almost 60% of our audience are learning leaders. Uh, that's the most. And then we've had a, a smattering of, of others uh, from sales leaders, sales trainers, and sales enablement. Um, so, and I, I'm sure all of you are, are here because you want to learn a little bit more about uh, sales development and development of sales teams. So let's uh, roll on here. We'll move to the next slide. So we'll start with uh, keys to sales leadership and learning. And our, our research at Brandon Hall Group indicates that most organizations believe that to have real business impact, leaders have to do a better job of connecting with their team members and developing talent to drive business results. That's easier said than done, of course, because most leaders have myriad responsibilities and feel overburdened often saying they don't have time to do some of the things that we really need them to do. So on the next slide, we, we asked our research respondents in a recent survey conducted late last year about the most important step to successfully manage sales professionals in the emerging work environment. And 92% of organizations said that they needed to upskill leaders. And so let's talk about that for a minute. The old school approach to sales leadership uh, and I was in sales at 1.2, was to create a, an onboarding process, make it as quick as possible, push the reps through it, give them the tools that they needed to, to, to at least get going, and then send them out in the field. And a lot of it was trial and error and learning by experience. And, you know, the world is a complex place now. This really doesn't work anymore. And in, in this current environment, sales leaders need to get the most out of each of their sales reps, and that takes development and coaching and nurturing. So our research shows that sales leaders need to improve their management skills and acquire new skills. And that's because many sales leaders, and this uh, applies to other professions too, but I think particularly in sales, they're promoted because of their sales skills. Uh, they were good at the job before they got to become a manager. But there's much more to being a sales leader than than sales and being able to, to drive revenue. Sales leaders must be trained and given the time to become talent developers and coaches. And we're gonna go into more detail on what all that means. The sales expertise is still important, of course, but only if it can be leveraged to develop the sales teams, improve their skills, and help them develop their careers, which we're also gonna talk about. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Claude. You know, we talk about the old school approach. We we promote the ones that are doing really well. We ask them to step up into a leadership role. We don't give them the tools, or in the past, we didn't give them the tools to be successful. And they were just becoming managers, people who just managed by numbers or tried to teach people the way they did it. And as we know, not everyone takes coaching the same, not everyone learns the same. You have to meet people where they are. And um, some stats that jumped out at me that I was reading the other day, about 60% of sales leaders don't have enough time to do frequent coaching because they're looking at their numbers. They're jumping into different meetings with their other leaders, their business partners. And then another stat that jumped out at me was just like, okay, wow, we, we really need to improve in this area is 93% of, sale, of salespeople do not get effective frequent coaching. And that's from the objective management group. So there is some room for improvement when it comes to leaders becoming better leaders themselves or managers becoming leaders. So uh, as we go through this, I just wanna remind everybody, we'd love to hear your comments and what's going on in your organization. Um, uh, and we can include some of those as we go, or you can just be sharing it with your, your colleagues as, as you listen to the webinar. So we want to move on now and, and talk specifically about skills that sales leaders need. And again, this is um, from research we've done uh, last year. And you can see that a high percentage of, of organizations believe, in particular, four skill sets are necessary. One is team leadership. Uh, a sales leader has a team, uh, and just driving them to sell more is not going to get the job done. There needs to be trust and mutual respect. 
There needs to be shared vision and sense of purpose. Um, setting clear goals tied to both individual goals and team and organizational priorities. And accountability, accountability for the sales reps and make sure they're accountable, but also that the leader is accountable. Uh, and then of course, open communication and ongoing communication. So team, team leadership is, I think, big in all of HCM. It tends to be the, the top skill that organizations are investing in it overall in 2023 for leadership. And it's particularly important for sales teams. And then there's the coaching that David mentioned, and we'll get into that more often. This is often misunderstood as feedback or correcting subpar performance when it's really part of the learning function. It's creating a dialogue, asking questions uh, of the sales rep to for self-discovery and developing skills and, and helping them find their way. Uh, and coaching is really important. And then the other thing that doesn't get talked about enough, I don't think, is emotional intelligence, which involves self-awareness of the leader of recognizing and understanding their emotions, what you're feeling and why, as well as appreciating uh, how your emotions and the way you present yourself are affecting those around you. There's also self-regulation so that you, once you un are in touch with your emotions, that you can control them and control situations and not create overly stressful situations whenever possible. Also, the ability to motivate, the ability to empathize and uh, having just generally good social skills to be able to interact, communicate, converse with your team. Inclusion is also cited by 84% of organizations focusing on collaboration uh, with everyone, listening actively to understand what the needs are of your team and that everyone feels heard, that they have a role in the team and they're valued. And then finally, business acumen, which isn't as high, but only because I think as, as a group, sales leaders have lots of business acumen, uh, but it also goes beyond just driving revenue. It's understanding the vision, mission, and values of the business as a whole and connecting to those through the daily work and interactions of the sales team. So those that's what we'd like to aspire to. This is what we'd like the sales leaders to have. But as we show on the next slide, there are a lot of challenges. And David's going to talk about that and how we can, can solve some of those things. But the, the biggest thing is that leaders have too many demands on their time. 76% of organizations say that's the biggest challenge. It's significantly more than anything else. And I, this, isn't, uh, this isn't unique to sales teams. It's across the corporate landscape where managers are given so many responsibilities that they're really uh, challenged to really focus on the people that are making everything work. So in some organizations are really even thinking about the structure of sales leadership jobs and responsibilities. We work with, with one bank as a huge sales call center and they basically completely changed the structure because they believe their leaders need to be coaches and people managers. And they had too many administrative uh, responsibilities. So they created some additional automation that they hadn't had before. And they also gave some administrative assistance to the sales leaders so that they could actively, and they also uh, shrunk the size of the teams that each leader was responsible for, which was very high at this particular bank. And so they, they really, change the culture and change the structure so that they could do a better job of developing their sales talent. So managers need to be more, become talent developers than driving workflow. And although obviously that's still part of the job. So yeah, David, what's your experience good. here? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a good point, uh, Claude, because you know we hire sales leaders to develop the talent of the, the, the green salesperson, right? We hire people for their talent and our job as leaders is to develop that talent and it's it's an investment for the company. So we as leaders need to get better at developing the talent so it's a long-term investment and it pays off in the end. Is it, I, and I know what you're saying there, Claude, there's a lot of demands. There's not enough hours in the day for a leader. <clears throat> you're stuck in meetings, as I said earlier, with your different business partners. You are stuck on those admin parts of the job. 
entering data, analyzing data, right? We want to look at data because it, it tells the truth, doesn't tell the whole truth, but it drops us clues so we can become better coaches off those clues. But again, there's not enough hours in the day. So we have to find tools out there to help automate some process or take some of the stuff off our plate, but still give that development to our salespeople. So moving on to the, the next slide here, here's, here's the bottom line of what we're really talking about, is that there's this huge gap our research shows between the importance of learning in driving business success in sales as well as other. 62% of organizations say L&D is critically important to the success of the business. But then when you ask them about the impact, the effectiveness of learning, only 22% say that learning del is delivered in such a way as to drive business results. And the way that learning needs to be delivered in this day and age is more in a contextualized or personalized way. And what that means is that, and you've probably, if you've been on our webinars in the past, you've heard us talk a lot about this, is there needs to be options for learners who have different styles. It can't just be a class or a course. There needs to be reinforcement. There needs to be a lot of different things. And David, will will get into some of those. Um, there's still way too much emphasis on providing knowledge and discussing what sales reps need to do rather than understanding and adapting to sales reps learning styles and creating learning experience that help them understand how to do something and how to do it well. So offering these options, uh, connecting so that uh, people can connect to different learning styles is really important. The one fit size fits all, uh, classroom driven learning, and even you know basic e-learning just doesn't provide the uh, all the tools that sales people need to succeed. So what does that mean? If we go to the next slide, the bottom line here is that only 17% of organizations believe that learning uh, is effective enough to abate the, the famous Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, meaning most people forget most of what they have learned within a short period of time, anywhere from a few hours to a few days, depending on what it is. So if you're not reinforcing the learning, if you're not giving uh, practice, the ability to practice, if you're not coaching, if you're not doing the things that really drive results, uh, you're, you're not, gonna, not gonna be where you, you wanna be. So we're gonna switch gears and drill a little bit deeper, but before we do that, we wanna give you another poll question and give you a chance to, to give your opinion. And uh, beyond answering the question, again, feel free to provide comments to us. So the question here is to what extent do you have a culture of continuous personalized learning? So do you not do this at all right now? Um, you're not, you do it, but you're not very good at it. Um, you're doing it, but you need more improvement or you're pretty good at it, or you're like world-class, you're almost nearly perfect at doing this. So to what extent do you have a culture of continuous personalized learning? We've, we've asked this question before, it's often pretty interesting to see where people are with this and see if organizations are making progress. So David in, in a minute is gonna kind of Talk about what a Lego does in this regard. And uh, they've got a really good handle, I think, on this and, and do a really good job. So uh, we'll be uh, focusing on that in just a minute. Let's see what the results are. So uh, more than half, 55% saying you're doing it, but more improvement is needed. Uh, not very many people aren't doing it at all, um, which I think that percentage three or four years ago when we asked this question would have been three or four times as high. Uh, so organizations are really working hard at this. And obviously people have, uh, companies have a ways to go, but it's great to see people are really trying to do this and it's difficult. Uh, resources are tight. There's, there's a lot going on that uh, keeps organizations from personalizing, contextualizing learning, but it's great to see people are really working at it. So David, let me turn it over to you and talk about the, the types of learning that you feel, you know, have the most impact and is working for Allegro. Yeah, yeah. So I'll hit on this slide and I'll try to get off my soapbox. 
or I won't stay on my soapbox too long talking about a Lego, but you know, the three sources of learning in field observation of others on the job informal learning and then peer collaboration. So one of the things that we do really well here at Alego is provide our reps with continuous ongoing training and support. Now we do eat our own dog food, right? We have a platform and I wish I had this platform at Dell Tech um, when I was leading a, a business unit of 33 salespeople. Um, and we, do, like I said, we eat our own dog food. We use our own platform. There are a couple vendors in our space that do a few things that we do. I consider us the Swiss Army knife of sales enablement. We do many things and we do it really well, but I'm able to provide my reps with foundational learning that they need to understand their daily tasks. But I think where we really thrive is that continuous reinforcement of their training efforts and upskilling them where they may be falling short. And there's different ways we do that. So inside of our platform, we have the ability to have flashcards. And this is where you can create different flashcards that are sent out to them on a daily basis to engage them with different types of questions to increase their knowledge base, right? It's that repetition of learning over and over and over again, because repetition is the mother of all learning. So we want to make sure we're upskilling them with their product knowledge or competitive knowledge. Uh, we have the ability to create content libraries with bite-sized videos of their peers giving out best practices, um, how they handle objections. We have a series called Amplify Success where we just ask our sales team to send out different types of videos of what's working with them, right? If it's working for somebody, let's scale that out for the rest of the group, share that with the group. In the remote world, it's very difficult to do that if you don't have a platform like ours in place. Um, I know when you're in the office, other people could hear you do something on the phone or if you're out in the field with them, you'll see it, but not everyone does. So those bite-sized videos come in um, into play and they're very key to helping our reps upskill or upskill themselves. And then one thing I love is our simulators. So we have a simulator that you can program and it's a bot. So it's a pre-made simulator where you program the bot to say a few things and it's, it gives the sales rep the ability to practice on their own. So they can practice their cold call, they can practice objections, they can practice uh, delivering different types of messaging. So they don't need to do it with a peer and they don't have to do it with themselves. So, or they do it with themselves, but it's actually a bot talking back and forth to them. So it's pretty cool. Um, and the next thing is the automated call intelligence insights that help me quickly identify where to coach without having to go through a hundred different calls and look at, okay, these are 100 calls. I got to figure out where to coach this person. It will actually give me a holistic view of all the coach, the calls that have been coached in the past and show me the reps deficiencies. And then I can actually figure out, all right, what is the best approach to coach this rep based on the data that I'm looking at? So our tools are definitely there in place to take them some things off the leader's plate and automate them. Next slide. Yeah, so just before you can stay on this slide, Alexa, but just to reinforce what David's saying, the simulations that he that he's talking about are so important. And um, we've found that uh, since COVID, more and more organizations are are thinking about using simulations, and but still a relatively small number of organizations are using it. And especially in sales, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and we've seen like a five-fold increase in use of simulations in various areas of learning, but it's still a relatively few organizations, probably about a quarter now are doing it in some way. So if there's something that you really think about investing of these kind of tools that David was just talking about that allow sales teams to practice um, and for you to get a good sense of what they're struggling with so you can help them is, is really important. And so when you do these kind of things and you have this contextualized personalized learning, the research shows that it has a huge impact, right? 95% says, says that um, you can improve individual performance, learner adoption and engagement is high, overall engagement is high, improving the depth and length of learning retention increases. So there's, there's huge benefit here. It does kind of require uh, a mindset change sometimes in trying new things, but the impact is really strong. 
So let's move on now to uh, our next topic. And again, feel free to throw in any comments or uh, what's going on in your organization that we can share. Um, so we're gonna talk now about encouraging continuous learning and career growth. So the, the bottom line here, no, just stay on that, that other slide for just a minute, uh, Watson. We just don't want learning to be for learning's sake or even for the sake solely of improving skills. Employees are often asked, and we get this all the time when we do personal research calls, is what is in it for me? You know, it's great that I'm taking this learning to improve my skills so I can do my job better. But what about me? Training must have a purpose for the sales rep beyond their job performance. Learning and training for sales reps and for sales leaders for that matter must deliver mutual benefit. So how is the company gonna help the sales rep grow? So now we can move to the next slide. And, and what we found is that this is critical in terms of talent retention as well. The most frequent reasons for employees leaving organizations, number one, is limited development and career opportunities. So it's learning and development, but also how is it going to help me advance? What is it, what's in it for me, in other words? So this means not just learning courses, but creating a variety of ways for the sales rep to develop on the job. And for instance, you can maybe look at new responsibilities within the current job or special projects or the coaching that David's talked about and we'll talk more about. And so when you, when you do these kinds of things, it helps the overall environment, it helps the employee feel more valued and that there's a reason for them to stay. And so you see 42% of organizations say that people leave because of stress, a stressful environment. Stress is part of sales. It's just the way it is and it's never going to change. But if you can supplement them with career opportunities so they don't feel they're just having to run a treadmill all the time and you're giving them an opportunity to grow, it can have a big, big impact. Now, David, I know you feel the same way. Are you there? David? Oh, I think we might have lost him. Hopefully he'll he'll come back in a, a couple of minutes. So um let, let's move on to the next slide and we can we can come back. So this, is, uh, this slide simply shows that organizations that enable consistent and meaningful participation in career development, only 36% of organizations believe they do a good job. Um, we ask about the importance of career development in many of our research studies, and it always ranks in, in, at the very top in terms of importance and toward the very bottom in terms of execution. Most organizations are really struggling with career development. So part of the challenge is enabling the employees themselves to participate in their career development. So it's important for the leader to be coaching, to be having career conversations, um, to be counseling them, to be mentoring them when necessary. It, but it's also important for the organization as a whole to give individual salespeople the opportunity to see what their career opportunities are. So if you have an app or a website that allows them to plan out different career paths, uh, and if are you making sure that job opportunities are posted quickly and maybe even before they're made public to external candidates? There's a lot of different things that you can do to show the sales rep that you care about their career development. Yeah, I think that's an important, Claude. I'm sorry about that. I, as we were talking before jumping onto this webinar, I said I had some internet issues and it shouldn't be an issue, but it became an issue, right? Uh, I do apologize for that, but that's a good point, right? Showing them that the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the people coming into the workforce, so I like to use this analogy, is they're coming from playing a lot of video games. And in video games, I remember there was a game when I was in college called Grand Theft Auto. And I think that and it was Grand Theft Auto 5, and that game is still played by a lot of people um to this day 
And what they're the Grand Theft Auto is doing is they're giving them new things to do in the game. It's the same game over and over and over again, but they're giving them new things to try out in the game to make the game more fun. So as leaders, we have to do that, not make them play video games, but go out and figure ways to enable our team, find new skills that on our own, go out and develop new skills ourselves and come back and coach and train and coach our reps on these new skills. And to Claude's point about building out a program, and it's something that I've done at many companies that I've been at, is build, build out that progression program where as they go through the program, we're getting them new skills. We're, we're giving them the avenues, the, the ability to develop these new skills. And after they've built these new skills, they get to move up a level. While they're probably still doing the same job, they're getting these little micro promotions that they can put out on their LinkedIn. They're getting these little bumps in pay that may not be a lot of money, but it, it's still like, hey, I, they're rewarding me for doing a good job and I feel like they're investing in me. So it doesn't have to be a lot of money or a huge promotion, but it's these little micro bumps that keep people excited to come in each day. Yeah, and people often ask us uh, when we work with them uh, about, well, are any of these things really meaningful? And I think the, the key there, and, and David alluded to this, is well, you, you need to ask them what's meaningful, right? It might be different for for different groups or different teams about what it, what would be meaningful for them. Some people want to move up the ladder. Other people just want some different responsibilities or try different things or uh, change things up so that things don't get monotonous or it gives them a break in, in the stress and the, the day-to-day uh, stuff that they do. Um, and so part of the, the key here is not just trying to come up with things yourself, but understanding what your team wants and then try to construct opportunities around that. And it, I, I can speak from personal experience. I, I used to run organizations of 150, 200 people that it, it often doesn't take much for people to be appreciative, appreciative of opportunities. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just, just listen to what they need and, and try, try things out. And you can change things up. If one thing doesn't work, try something else. But trying, I think, and, and really being in touch with your team is, is important. So let's move on to the next. So all that said, right, we know that there are a lot of barriers to improving career development programs. Um, the most common, uh, as, as we've kind of alluded to, is not having career paths beyond moving people up the ladder. Um, and career development is hard, which is why organizations need to focus on it. And um, you can see here the different barriers and probably some of these resonate with you. Um, I won't go through every, every one, but um, just because you have these barriers doesn't mean that through some innovation uh, that you can't make some changes. And, and again, small steps, baby steps. You don't have to reinvent or invent a huge career development program overnight. Just try to give people a reason to feel like they're valued and there's a place for them to go. David, anything to add there? No, you made a good point. Um, make them feel valued, right? And the way we do that is we give them our time. We That's give right. them different ways to get better at their job. Again, it goes back to the investment, not just hiring them just because they have talent. We wanna hire them because of their talent but develop them so they stay. And I think we saw that with a, lot, a few years ago when people were leaving their companies for other employers because they weren't valued and they weren't being upskilled and they weren't being developed. They were just being say It was that hire the island approach and whoever survives, they survive. But if they don't, they don't. But what we need to do now is make sure that we're giving our time and making sure we're, we're developing our reps so they feel like they're valued. And that's where the the person to person overall communication comes in. Every person is a little bit different. So the more you can the sales leader can connect with the, the sales rep, you can create individual experiences and understand what differences are different needs are and different desires are within the team. You you can't take a one size fits all approach either. So those that ability to communicate, to connect on an ongoing basis is so critical. So let's move on. We want to talk a little bit about identifying and developing high potential team members. 
And this is kind of an outgrowth of career development, right? Some sales reps have more potential than others, and the organization should invest those in those people in order to move the organization forward and keep the best talent. High potential identification and development tends to be driven by performance. In other words, a great sales performer, somebody with big numbers, is more likely to be targeted for advancement than anyone else. But performance is certainly important. But what we want to stress is it's not the only factor for potential, and or maybe not even the most important factor. And we use a simple model here at Brandon Hull Group to talk about how to understand the uh, potential of sales professionals as well as other employees. You can go to the next slide, Alexa. So here are the basic steps, right? So first of all is capabilities. Understand a person's capabilities. And this is not merely based on how they perform their present job or how they've performed in previous jobs, but what kind of experiences do they have both in the business world and also even in personal lives? Uh, how have assessments gone in terms of maybe skills that don't specifically pertain to their job, but they can come in handy for maybe a management role or a different role within the organization? You want to have a full understanding of the whole individual, not just how they are as a salesperson, but what other capabilities do they have that might be uh, of value? if not now, in the future. The second thing is engagement. You know, some people come and they do their job. They do a, a pretty good job, maybe even a great job, but, but they're not necessarily invested in the organization. They're not necessarily active in helping the team in um, maybe being a peer coach, uh, giving ideas, participating in team meetings, all these things show a level of engagement and loyalty perhaps or interest in the organization. So somebody who's really great performer, but kind of ignores everybody and doesn't really, isn't a great team member necessarily, may have less potential down the road than someone who maybe does a pretty good job, but really shows an interest in ongoing improvement, helping the team, helping the organization, et cetera. And then there's the aspirations. What does the individual want from their career in the job? Sometimes somebody might have great potential, uh, great skills, but maybe they just wanna do the job that they're doing. They have other interests in their lives. Uh, other people, you know, they're all about work. They're really motivated to drive their career. Uh, they really wanna move up the ladder. They really wanna learn new things. Uh, they really want to help other people on the team. So understanding their aspirations along with their level of engagement and of course their capabilities, both current skills and maybe skills that might not be as apparent, give you a much more, um, a much fuller picture of the potential of an employee. So sales leaders need to be involved with their team members and meet regularly with them to discuss progress as people and professionals. And there needs to be a balance of different types of learning that, it's, that the leader uses. And David, do you wanna kind of get into that a little bit and yeah, how that all I, balances up? Yeah. Yeah, definitely you can do that. Um, you know, synchronous and asynchronous coaching and how does that come into play of, of being a better leader? So uh, think about the old school approach where we were in the office five days a week, synchronous coaching worked. We could pull someone aside into a room and review a call with them because we saw what they were doing. If they weren't busy, we just grab them or we could just sit right next to them, um, splice into the call. Maybe I'm, I'm dating myself. I'm pretty old. So you can splice into the call and use the dual headset to listen to what they're doing. You give them that synchronous coaching. But now that we're in the remote world, some people going into the, uh, the office a few days a week or they're just fully remote, it's really hard to tell when they're free and you can give that coaching. So in asynchronous coaching is you know when people are free so you're not you could pull up a call we use call intelligence here at lego and i'll listen to the call and i'll put in notes and i'll put in questions now it may take that person a few hours or a day or two to get back to me but i can do that on my own time and they can go back and look at my coaching or they could respond to my coaching 
in their time. So I'm not disrupting their day. I don't know where they are if they're remote. They should be on the call on calls or, you know, in front of their computer, but I don't want to break up their day. So that's where asynchronous coaching comes in. But it also just doesn't have to do with calls. So instead of e emails, um, and if you all know disk profiles, I'm a high D. So if you send me a long email, I'm not going to read it. So what we do now is we do Lego videos and we send those videos out and the uh, people that we're sending to can put comments in there. They can like it and they can ask questions. So that's asynchronous communication. They're going to, I'm going to push it out and then they can respond when they have the ability to do so. So it's really helped with our communication and our coaching. Want to move on to the next? So, and, and going back to making uh, the asynchronous or sending out the videos um, to the sales reps or the reps sending us videos, it just doesn't have to do with the, the leader to the salesperson. Um, peer to peer coaching is huge in the remote world. So, I have salespeople all over the US. And one of the things that we leverage is listening to each other's calls or listening to each other's role play simulators or going in and doing recording for our team on best practices and sending that out. So the Allegro platform allows us not just to listen to calls and learn from each other, right? As they say, um, one of my favorite books, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you wanna, uh, go somewhere, talk to someone who's already been there. So this peer-to-peer -peer coaching, if you see someone doing really, really well and they're crushing their number, we can go listen to their calls and we can put in questions. Hey, why did you do this in that part of the call? And then that person can respond to them. So it's not just the leader coaching the salespeople. We leverage our platform to make it collaborative and do peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Yeah, this the kind of peer-to-peer -peer coaching uh, that Dave is talking about, especially for this uh, younger generations of sales folks, is incredibly impactful. It, it goes beyond work. It's what they're used to, right? It, they, they've been involved in social media since they were young people, and people connect with each other. They, they ask each other questions. They uh, talk to each other about their experiences, and, and you can translate and transfer that focus on, on social collaboration to the workplace and it really has great impact. When we asked uh, uh, some leaders uh, in a focus group that we did uh, for our leadership research about the, the different tools that could help them in their leadership journey, peer-to-peer -peer feedback was number one. The leaders especially, but also sales professionals, I think, like to learn from people who are actually doing what they're doing. Um, and so you, you just can't say enough about this. And it, it has another function. This collaboration also drives the sense of belonging, values, uh, drives their value to the organization, um, drives their feeling that this is a place they want to be because they get to share and they get to learn from their peers. So it, it, I think it really helps sales performance. It also helps you in many other ways. As you yeah, Claude, if I could jump in here, yeah. going back identifying sales talent. How do you identify that top sales talent? With the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, my top sales talent, and I can see when they do this, they go into their peers' calls. They'll ask the peer first if I, you know, can I give you some coaching? And they'll go in and they'll start coaching calls on their own. So it takes things off my plate, takes things off my leader's plate, and it's that peer-to-peer -peer coaching. But again, it's those things that we look for to identify top sales talent. Is this person worth investing in? And when I see someone do that, they are worth investing in. Right. And so as you see sales folks doing their, their jobs and they're, they're being active and they're working with their peers, that's the really important thing to focus on in terms of evaluating employee performance. This, this graphic shows that 83% of organizations still focus on past performance more than future potential. Only 17% are focusing on the future potential. So when you do that coaching, when you do the peer-to-peer -peer learning, you're seeing people interact, you're seeing their interest level, you're seeing how they're learning, how quickly they're learning. Uh, 
that is really what you should be focusing on. Whatever their performance has been, even unless it's been, you know, really bad, but if it's been okay, it's been pretty good, but are they doing the things that can make themselves better to help the organization down the road? Those are, those are the things that you focus on more on evaluating employee performance. So we're just curious as we uh, begin to wind down here, and I'll remind you that we're gonna have some time for questions and we'd love to get some of your questions in the Q&A bubble or in the chat, uh, is to ask you a final poll question coming up on the next slide. And we just want you to rate your organization's ability to identify and develop high potential sales talent. So it's kind of the same scale as before. We don't, we're not doing this at all. We're, we're doing it, but we're not good at it. We're doing it, but you know, we, we really could use some more improvement or we're pretty good at it or um, we're, you know, we're world-class. We're really nearly perfect at this. And I, I know this is a focus for a lot of organizations now are really trying to do a better job of developing, identifying and developing high potential talent. So it'll be interesting to see um, what people have to say. And in the meantime, love to hear your experiences, what's going on in your organization. You could put it in the chat or get any questions from me. So Alexa, do we have results yet? Maybe they weren't able to get into the poll. We'll give you a couple more minutes or maybe a few more seconds. So just um, reach your organization's ability to identify and develop high potential sales talent, ranging from you're not doing this at all, all the way to you're nearly perfect. Just uh, pick one and we'd just love to see where you are. And then we'll begin to wrap up and uh, give us some time for questions. And we're beginning to get some, so that's great, thank you. So here are the results. Again, 65%, uh, they're doing it, but more improvement is needed. Um, so really a total of 85% are doing it, but you know maybe still need to work on it, but they're working on it. And I, I think this is a, a work in progress for most organizations, um, but it is. So if you're working on it and you're really trying to get better at it, you're in a good place because most organizations are prioritizing high potential development as a, as a key goal for 2023, according to our outlook research. So thank you for that. And just some key takeaways here, and uh, David, feel free to, to add anything that maybe we haven't touched on yet, but you know, we wanna look for ways to empower and enable your sales leaders to be better coaches and talent developers. That's really the, the key here is we need sales leaders who are uh, creating value for the organization, who are creating connections with the team, that are coaching, making them better, um, and giving them a reason to stay with the organization. And so to do that, you need to build an environment of continuous learning that develops skills in a variety of ways that align not only with the organization's goals, but with the team, the individual's career goals. And then, and then, of course, as we were just saying, go beyond current or past performance and evaluating a sales rep's potential to advance in the organization. Consider capabilities beyond the current job as well as engagement and aspiration. Yeah, I, I think those are, are great, Claude. And what I would say is, as you leave this webinar, um, ask yourself, you know, what is the coaching methodology that I have in place for my leaders today? And are they following it? And what are your checks and balances you have in place today to make sure everyone is coaching the same? Because, you know, you could lose a leader tomorrow and who's going to come in and take their spot? Who's going to be able to just slide into their chair to continue that same coaching? And if they're coaching differently and they're not doing, using the same methodology, you're going to run into some, some bumps there. Great. So let's go to, to Q&A and we have a few uh, questions coming in and and one uh, that I found pretty interesting is, um, will the return to in-person sales diminish the value of uh, CI technology because more meetings won't be recorded? That's interesting, David. Well, why wouldn't they be recorded? 
they should if they're still using the phone to make calls they should still be recorded and you know when we when we were in office having our calls recorded was still very important because you could pull those up in a in a sales meeting and you know do some peer to peer coaching there or you know if someone is trying to be onboarded you want to have them have a library of what good calls look like what bad calls look like and share them with them or you know turn those into training we we use our call recordings for our active listening training where we take a call that is recorded we break it up into little spots with little prompts in there and say how would you handle this and allow people to um, select how they handle it and if they handled it wrong it would say no you should have done it this way so uh, moving back to in office I, I, I hope people don't uh, or I hope people still record their calls because it's very valuable um, it's kind of like game tape or game film you, you want to always go back and look look what you could have done better you know like an after action report look at what happened on that call listen to it figure out what you got to do next time and then get after it great Here's another one uh, kind of on the technology realm. My team already uses a handful of different enablement tools for learning, engagement, content management, CRM. How do you approach adding new tech to the stack? Well, what, I, what I'm hearing is you're using a bunch of technologies. So your reps have to jump into different technologies or your leaders have to jump into um, different technologies. What I would say is you should probably look to consolidate. So if you, you don't just add another technology to add another technology, if you can find it, a platform out there, similar to a Lego, not trying to be salesy here, but it, what we need to do in these economic, during this economic climate is consolidate. So look at the cost of all these tools. And if you can find a tool that does it one, consolidate into one and make your reps lives a much easier so they don't have to keep jumping into different technologies. Great. Uh, we have a question, uh, another question here. Uh, going back to kind of the call recording, what do you recommend for organizations that don't have automatic call recording? That's a tough one, um, especially if in your, your remote world. What we've done in the past is make calls on Zoom and do some synchronous coaching. But if you don't have a call intelligence platform right now and your your organization is call heavy, uh, make the case to the people who own the budget that this is an investment that's going to pay off fairly in, in a short period of time because you need to record calls. You need to hear what people are saying. If you're you're taking the time and your business partners are taking the time to do all this training and the people aren't taking and using that training on the phone, that's hurting your bottom line. So invest in a call intelligence platform. There are <clears throat> platforms that will see if, see if it's... Um, two-party consent or one-party consent. If it's two-party consent, it won't record it. If it is one-party consent, it will record it, and that's following the law. So I would say, net-net, uh, make the case, get a call recording. It's gonna benefit you and your team. Great. Here's uh, a question. I think just maybe wanting you to add a detail or uh, what you were talking about before. Um, you're saying even in a perfect asynchronous environment, Sales managers still need to provide feedback to the refs, the reps. What are some techniques your team uses to, to lighten the load, if you will, which I mean, probably lighten the load on, on the sales manager, I guess, in order to provide great feedback to reps. So let me just clarify, how do we lighten the load? Because you have too many reps? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, let's see, even in a perfect, provide feedback to the reps. I guess just some, what are some techniques to, um, for the sales leader to provide the best feedback to the reps in whatever environment they're in? Yeah, so what our approach here or my approach to, that I've used over my career is divide and conquer. Um, if you have 10 reps and there's five of you, um, you know, you both take two reps or all you split it up. So each leader has two reps. And then as a leader of a unit, I always said, I want at least two to three calls coach per month per rep. So I'm not giving them a lot to do just three record or two or three recorded calls a month that you need to grade. So it's not giving them too much to do. It's just giving them a few to focus on 
and then just asking for two to three calls a month. But you also could ask what I do in my standups in the morning and I have my leaders do is we listen to a call all together with the sales reps and we coach that call together and then provide feedback in that call and give it to that rep. Yeah, that's great. Any other uh, thoughts, things that you want to share? Maybe even repeat from earlier that somebody might have missed. The importance of having a platform out there that is there to develop your reps. Um, like I said earlier, with enabling your team and making them feel like they're not just a number and you're there to uh, help them develop into the best salesperson they can be. Because you know, sales is a transferable life skill. You can use it anywhere. And if you just hire someone and say, here's, a, here's some leads, go after them, call it, and you're not engaging them on a daily basis or weekly or monthly basis, and you're not trying to build up their skills, you're going to have to replace that person in six months. So make sure you're out there. I know that you know not every CFO right now wants to hear about buying new tools, um, but it, it, it's one of those things that you invest in and it will pay off in the long term. So if you are using multiple tools, go out there and find a stack that will allow you to consolidate, save your CFO some money, but at the same time, make sure you're developing your reps. I think we have time for one more. And uh, I think this one talks about uh, is focusing on customization of messaging between a sales rep and a potential uh, client. And if you do that kind of customization and if you work with the sales reps to vary their message, uh, doesn't that risk uh, having the sales reps spend too much time personalizing their messaging? Um, I, I, I'm just, I, I don't know. Can we clarify that? That they're spending too much time on personalizing their message for one person, one company? Yeah, or in general, I guess. In other words, not making maybe not making enough calls because they're too busy just really uh, personalizing the messaging and spending too I guess the inference is spending too much time uh, trying to make the, the the best messaging and not enough time just getting on the phone and that's a quantity versus quality game right, right. Um, oh being in sales the best thing you can do is test things out so break your group up into. Uh, people who are hyper-personalized and some people who are just more of the shotgun approach and see which nets the best outcome for you. Um, I like the personalization because there's so much noise out there that you need to personalize to get someone's attention. Right. And, you know, when you're personalizing, um, you're going to get that person's attention. You're going to build a rapport off the bat and they're going to be more willing to have a conversation with you than rather taking that shotgun approach. And they, they, they can feel on the other end of the line that you, they are just another number to you. So I'm for personalization, but you know, I always say test things out and see how that goes. And then if you are recording your calls, um, go look at those call recordings and see how it's going. That's a, well, that's one thing that sale, I find sales leaders don't do a good job at is they push out all these initiatives, but they don't go back and reflect and see if it actually worked. They don't track it. Yeah, and this we have uh, one comment from Morris on that. He says, uh, personalize, yes, but do it within a system so you're not reinventing the wheel with every presentation. Yeah, exactly. Th th that's exactly right. Thanks for sharing that. I think we've gotten to most of the questions and we want to make sure to get uh, people off on time. So we'll, we'll uh, sign off today. I want to thank Alego and, and David for their sponsorship and David's wisdom and insights into uh, driving talent development and sales organizations. Uh, and um, I think you've given people a lot to think about, a lot to, to um, maybe uh, create some goals for how they can improve talent development within their sales organizations. So thank you. Thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And we look forward to seeing many of you on another Brandon Hall Group webinar very soon. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Oh, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>